Hey there, and welcome back to the Direct Selling Accelerated podcast. My name is Sam Hind, and today you are in for an incredible treat. I have got an amazing individual coming in to speak to you all today about the power of attitude. The cool thing is that this is an individual who has an amazing, amazing opportunity to work with some of the most incredible people in the world, but this individual stands alone. Today, I'm going to be introducing you to the amazing Mark Schulman. Now, Mark Schulman has enjoyed an unprecedented career over the last 30 years as a first call drummer for world-class pop and rock artists, including people like Pink, who he's been working for for the last 14 years and continues to work for, Sheryl Crow, Foreigner, Stevie Nicks, Beyonce, and the list goes on and on. Today, I was absolutely blessed to be able to have an awesome conversation with Mark about the power of attitude, both the power of attitude in his career and the power of attitude of those amazing individuals that he's got the pleasure of working with. You are going to love, love, love this interview. Get your pen and paper out because he dropped so many amazing gold nuggets. We all love those gold nuggets along the way. And he's going to give you guys an incredible opportunity at the very end of this podcast as well. So get listening. This is going to be an awesome, awesome session. I hope you enjoy and get ready. Mark Schulman has had a front row seat performing with legendary acts including Billy Idol, Foreigner, Velvet Revolver, Stevie Nicks, Cher, and Pink. And he is here to be your personal rock star. Get ready to rock! Please welcome Mark Schulman. Well, hey, Mark, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Direct Selling Accelerator podcast. Sam, I'm so excited to be here. What, how many thousands of miles away are we? I know, right? And what's real, what time is it there for you guys right now? Because it's early in the morning here. It's 4.44 in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, You know, this is one of the things that I think is just so magic about the season that we're in is that we've all become so used to this virtual yeah. world, which means we can do this. This is great. Yeah. For and all of our listeners, Mark, we've we've already done a little bit of an introduction, but would you like to tell everybody a little bit about you? I'm a Virgo. I love long walks in the park. <laughs> and well, I am one of the most grateful men on the planet. I have managed to navigate one of the most profound drumming careers, having played with Everybody from, I've been with Pink for nearly 15 years. While I was playing with Pink, I was also playing at times with Foreigner and Cher. I worked with Billy Idol, Sheryl Crow, Simple Minds, Richard Marks, Michael Hutchins, one of the great Japanese artists, Akichi Azawa, Udo Lindenberg. I know I'm leaving out a bunch of people. Uh, Dave Koz, I've spent my life being able to support some of the greatest artists on the planet. And then I sort of parlayed that into a speaking career, leveraging what I know and having really studied the artists with whom I've worked under to really study their success. And I'm writing my second book on the power of attitude. And that's primarily what I'm speaking on these days. My first book was called Conquering Life Stage Fright, Three Steps to Top Performance, which you can get on Amazon. And the second book is tentatively titled entitled Hacking Attitude. And my speech is called <laughs> Hacking the Rockstar Attitude. Yeah. So, because I will get more deeply into the power of attitude because I live by it, I swear by it. And that's why I'm writing my next book about it, co writing it with one of the most brilliant men that I know. Yeah, I love that. As you know, most of our listeners are direct sellers and they're people that have, uh, you know, in many cases, they've set up their own business. They've, they've never run a business before and they're kind of trying to find their way through it. And attitude is one of the most powerful things for them to master in many ways because it, it kind of is something you've got to master, right? I loved listening to you at the DSA conference recently. And I'd love to ask you, what inspired you to go from being a drummer with the stars to being a keynote speaker for some of the greatest companies on the planet? How did you make that switch? 
Well, it started with my genetics because I had two parents that were professors, college teachers. And my mother gave me my own class to teach because she ran the tutorial center. So at 19 years old, illegally, I was teaching a class I was thrown in. I thought, oh, I kind of like this. So I got the teaching gene. Then I started giving a lot of music seminars to drummers, probably a thousand what we call drum clinics. And at a point I realized, why should I limit this experience? Because people were resonating more with the success coaching and the stories and the how did I get there than they were the musical chops and licks. And I quickly realized if I learned about the corporate market and the collegiate market, I could essentially use the same format, but then I could deliver and I could be messaging and applying all these success secrets because I spent a lot of time studying a lot of philosophy, studying these artists with whom I work because mm -hmm. there's no accident of success. So there's so much to learn from Pink and Cher and Billy Idol. And when I give my actual keynotes, I tell stories and give examples. I'll, I'll probably just tell you a couple of stories off the cuff today about these artists that are incredible examples about how the world-class performers operate. Because yeah. I believe that we all have that ability to be world-class performers, whether you're a direct seller, whether you're a drummer, whether you're a speaker in any business you're in, what, you're an entrepreneur. So the only one that's putting any limitations on you is you. And I realized that and I thought the more creative I can be, the more I can leverage what I know from my life's experience to enhance my brand and enhance what I'm selling. Or now I, I, I say helping is the new selling because I believe it's really about being of service to people. Because if you're truly of service to people, then they gravitate towards your brand and then you're no longer selling. Then they become relationships as opposed to customers and clients. And I'm all about cultivating relationships because I'm convinced that my success is based on the relationships that I've cultivated. So if you approach it more like you're having relationships with people and you approach like, how can I really be of service to you and really believe so much in the brand and the product that you are representing and who you are being? You know, a, a dear friend of mine, Bruce Turkel, who's managed by my same management company, he's a branding specialist. And he said, people do not buy or choose what you do. They buy or choose who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And I realized it's who I am being. Who am I to pink? That's why I'm still in her band, because it's who I am to her. I may not be the greatest technical drummer in the world, but to her, I'm the greatest drummer in the world. So for you and your clients, you want to be the greatest brand and the greatest seller because you are really positioned for them to be of service. And they really sense that you are more about being of service to them than trying to sell them something. And there's a very, very big difference in your attitude about it. This all stems back to attitude. That's why I speak about attitude and I'm writing my book about attitude. I love that. Now, I've got a little bit of a left of center question here, Mark, and this is a bit of a pointy one. One of the things that we hear a lot, particularly in this industry, I'm going to say this goes everywhere, but particularly in this industry is when things are not going right, when things are, you feel maybe a bit stuck, maybe a bit overwhelmed, it's common to hear people complaining that, well, the company is doing this, the people in my team are doing that, my leader isn't giving me the support that I need. Now, just on the off chance, we've got someone listening to us right now that maybe has said those words just recently. Have you got a piece of advice for them to help them to get a little bit unstuck by maybe just doing a little bit of an, an attitude check? Yeah. Let me tell you a quick story. So we were in the middle of the, this European tour 10 years ago, and we were in Berlin, Germany, and Pink runs down the ramp. She runs down to the front. Normally, the dancers clip her in with two carabiner clips that are attached to two long cables that stretch across the entire audience and lifts her up against the uh, across the audience. And she does flips and turns and spins and spins around. It's it's the ending of the show. It's the song. So what? Well, we're in Berlin, Germany. She runs down. They clip her in. She lifts her arm to cue the computer operator, and she doesn't realize that one of the carabiner clips was turned upside down. The dancer could not clip her in. By the time she realized it, and the computer bloke realized it, in the two seconds it took him to hit the kill switch, she got brutally and rapidly dragged across the stage, 
dragged across hot lighting cans, a two meter drop into what we call the pit and pulled all the way up against the metal side railing. And it was the most frightening moment of my life, probably ever, but definitely on stage. Mm. The, The audience was dead silent. The band was dead silent. She was dead silent. And then I heard the sweetest sound as it was a sound of pink cussing. If she was cussing, she was alive. She was breathing. She was angry. But what happened next was crazy because her husband, Carrie, had jumped down to the pit to help her. He helped her. She insisted on jumping back onto the stage. Battered, bruised, beaten up. He had to climb onto the stage. She couldn't stand up by herself. She got on stage. The first thing she did was apologize to the audience. Yeah, wow. So what was she doing? She was putting the well-being of the customers, the clients, the audience, the band, the dancers, the singers, the crew, before her own well-being, she took full responsibility. She took full culpability. It wasn't her fault. I mean, it had nothing to do with her. But instead of passing the buck, there were 225 people on the road. Not one person got reprimanded. Not one person lost their job. So what I learned from that, for me, it's like, the great team members, the great band members, we take culpability, we take responsibility, we look out for each other, which means there's no excuses. So if you are trying to put responsibility or culpability on somebody else other than yourself, you are weakening your own position because you are no longer in control. And the moment you do that, then you don't have the ability to then make the changes and improvements. You're kind of throwing it off on somebody else. So we all go through tough times. But what I do is I shift my attitude. We cannot control what happens to us. But what makes attitude so incredibly powerful is you have the power to choose, change, or shift your attitude about what is happening to you. And your attitude is your point of view. It's your vantage point or your disadvantage point, depending upon the attitude that you choose. And remember, it's not what we look at. It's what we see or perceive that determines our experiences, the way you perceive yourself, the lens through which you see the world, the meaning that you attach to people, places, and circumstances are determined by the stories that you tell yourself. So what's the story that you're telling yourself? And who's telling the story? It's you. You're the narrator. Change the narrative. What's your story? I mean, is it a comedy? Great. Is it a melodrama? Uh Uh-oh. Is it a murder mystery? Is it a horror show? So you have the power. And if you want, I could take everybody through an immediate attitude shift. You want to hear like an immediate attitude shift that'll take one minute? Yeah. This is something that I do every single day. Yeah. Okay. It starts with initially thinking of the attitude, or you can call it state of mind or point of view that you want to create, like happiness, love, joy. Well, we'll take joy because joy is a really easy one. So this is what I do almost on a daily basis is you think of an attitude you want to create. And then what you want to do is you want to set your mind up so your mind knows something is about to happen. And I use the greatest psychology and physiology that I've learned to create the most immediate results. So what I immediately do is I count backwards by five, like it's a rocket launch. I count five, four, three, two, one. I shut my eyes, I clench my fists, I tighten my core, and I think of a time I was joyful. And I just sit with it for a minute. I was just thinking of a time a few weeks ago and my 11 year old daughter and I were having, uh, we call it a Zaid and Daddy Day, that's her name. And we were having so much fun. She was hugging me and she was grabbing me tight and I was smelling her hair and and she was holding me and I was tightening, you know, grabbing her tight and she's strong as an ox. She's a fifth degree brown belt, right? So the more (laughs) you can combine all your senses, you know, sight, touch, hearing, feeling, humor, sense of humor, I guess you can combine that too. So I do that as a meaning and attitude shift. And then what do I do? I do it again. Five, four, three, two, one. Close my eyes, clench my fists, tighten my core, and think of another time when I was joyful. I let it go. I was just thinking of a time where I got a chance to see the text chat after a virtual speech that I did a few weeks ago, and it just made me so joyful. So everybody right now, just try it, all right? It's so easy. I'm going to count backwards. I want you to all think of a time you were joyful. Combine all the senses you can to make the experience as powerful as you can. Are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Shut your eyes. Clench your fists. Tighten your core. Think of a time you were joyful. Hold it. Okay, good. Now we're going to do it one more time. Ready? You can count with me. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, 
One, close your eyes, clench your fists, tighten your core, think of a time you were joyful. Ah. Now I do this at least four times because yeah. if I do it four times, I get this big old shift eating grin on my face. <laughs> and as science would tell us, when you smile, you're activating hundreds of muscles in your face that send a signal to your body to relax and send endorphins to your brain. So this is a way to immediately shift your attitude. So if you get in a funk, I don't mean the good funk, like the funk you want to dance to, like the bad funk. You can immediately create an attitude shift. And I have a couple of other attitude shifts I use all the time. But if you start making excuses, you start feeling out of sorts, mm. do that exercise. It takes a minute. That will clean my attitude. I will just be in the greatest mood for two hours or the whole day. And if I'm not, I might do it 10 times a day because it takes about 30 seconds to do. So yeah. you have the power to create immediate attitude shifts. You have the power to control who you are, who you are being, take culpability, take responsibility, and take pride in the fact that you're an entrepreneur. And don't put it off on anybody else. No excuses. So good. So good. I love that. I'm definitely going to use that. Now, I know that in, in what you, that there's so many things in what you do in the band that would be exciting and get your adrenaline going, but there's also going to be some really tough times in there. You've been with the Pink Band for 15 years. Is that right? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the attributes that you possess and maybe some of the attitude shifts that you've had to make over the years to stay in the band for 15 years? Because I'm going to guess here that you've probably had some, some really tough times where you've had to do a bit of an, an attitude check yourself. Can you share maybe one of those times with us, Mark? Yeah. Well, the challenges I've had I haven't had so much the challenges with the people because we've just really built the relationship and we've mm -hmm. become quite a family um, because everybody is in that tour because they are the greatest at what they do, all 225 people when we did our stadium tour. Yeah. But there have been times, one time in particular, we were like, we were in-ear monitors and Pink and the dancers are relying on us because they're listening to us for cues. Yeah. So one night we're playing and everything's going great. And my pack that I have a little, uh, you know, a little battery pack that sends a signal to my inners. Well, my batteries went dead. Oh, no. So all of a sudden I couldn't hear. All I was hearing was a three second delay from the back of the room. Yep. And I immediately, my first instinct was to panic. But I realized if I panic, then I'm going to start rushing. I'm going to get way off and nothing's good going to become of it. So all of a sudden I realized, and I looked at the musical director, tried to get his attention, and I said, so he knew I couldn't hear, so he started telegraphing so I could still stay on the beat. Because yeah. I realized that it's kind of like the worse it gets, the more you really need to keep poised, hold your position. And in my case, because I'm setting the tempo, and if I start playing at a tempo, literally people can get confused and they're flying around. I mean, they can fall, they can die. So. It's really powerful and really potent that even in a very, very, and that's a, for me, that's a very frightening situation. You can imagine because everything is hinged on me being able to hear. Yeah. So much responsibility right? on you. Yeah. So um, that was, I had to really within a second consciously be more calm mm -hmm. when going against every instinct, which is like, ah! Help, I can't hear. What am I going to do? And I wanted to scream. You know, I wanted to, yeah. you know, but I knew that I had to hold my position. So that's an example of when things got really hairy, really fast, really scary. Then I just, okay, I'm just going to try to keep my tempo, keep my meter because I'm the one that's setting the meter for everybody else. Get the music, you know, get his attention yeah. and do the best I can. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, over the years, I'm sure that there are many attributes that you have had to possess in order to do what you do. Can you share a few of those with us? Well, what I've learned is the more I, the better listener I am, <laughs> the better band member, the better group member, the better team member I am. And, uh, you know, drummers are cool. Drummers are kind of like the foundation. I look at myself as being like the shepherd of the group, right? Mm -hmm. So like when everybody's getting in the bus, I let everybody else in first and I make sure that everybody gets it. I kind of feel like it's my responsibility to take care of everybody else. 
because I've started to realize that if everybody else around me is happy, it's really easy for me to be happy. Yeah. So when I start to pay attention and really listen to everybody else, I heard this great story about Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela's father was a tribal leader and he used to go around to the different tribes. He was like the grand tribal leader. And Nelson said the thing that he noticed about his father was he would get in a meeting, he would let everybody else talk first, everybody, and then he would speak last because people want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And if you're the great listener, then they truly believe that you care and you're present. You're not just like fake listening. You really, you're positioned, you're looking at them. You have empathy. That's what I talked about earlier. It's like if you're providing real concern and real connection with your customers, they, they are no longer customers, they become relationships. And for me, it's about building relationships. When you're building relationships and when you're helping instead of selling and when you're listening, then you become such an asset. And I tell my students, even my drumming students have big ears, listen, because everybody else wants to talk. If you're the one listening, wow, I learned that with my wife. It finally took me, it took me about 10 years, <laughs> but I finally got it. You know, she doesn't want me to solve her problems. Yes. Some people do. She wants me to listen because I'm a natural coach. I'm a natural mentor. It's what I do professionally. I coach people. I speak. She just wants me to listen. So I just sit there and yeah, honey, God, I get it. Oh, that must be, that must be hard. And the more I listen, she just goes, God, I love you. That was such a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I didn't say anything yet. Awesome. Do that, I totally you could do that with your clients, yeah, with your family members, with your associates. Yeah. People need to be heard. So that, um, you know, sort of sparks another question in me that I want to ask. And, and some of these, like I said, I've not prepared you for, so I'm just going to throw them out there. But I know that we, we can't control what other people do, nor should we want to. However, let's just say that we can see someone around us that maybe, that, let's just face it, they've got a really shitty attitude right now. And you're thinking, look, I can't control the attitude that they have, but have you got some tips or suggestions on how you might handle somebody that you you recognize maybe their attitude is affecting you. Maybe you can see that, you know, they they could really easily shift their success right now by changing their attitude. Have you got some tips to help when you're dealing with someone else with a bad attitude? Yeah, this can actually get kind of complex and we we're going to talk about it in our upcoming book, but everybody's sort of at a certain place with their attitude. We call it the attitude scale. Some people call it their MO. Like some people are are in an anger MO, and there are two MOs for anger. One is rebellious and one is determined. If you're rebellious, then you're pushing against something and you're trying to fight. If you're determined, you're angry, but you use that energy to actually get things done. Yeah. So you kind of look at where they're at and you try to take them, you listen, and you got to be very careful. I, I literally say, I'm going to surround, fill, and protect myself so I don't get too affected by their negativity. Yeah. And I hold my own position and I realize that what they're experiencing is what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It does not have to affect me. Like you could have somebody, and we used to do this, the gentleman I'm writing my book with, Dr. Jim Samuels, I've studied with for 35 years. Mm -hmm. We used to, in our classes, as part of our pre as part of what we'd learn, we'd pair up and we'd have somebody tell us what's the worst thing that your boyfriend or girlfriend or your teacher, or your friend can tell you. And they just repeat it over and over and over. So we just become impervious to it. So we realize that it doesn't have to affect us. It's only our decision if we allow it. So if someone's acting and has negative energy and you remember, that's their negative energy. And I can hold my position and I can still be who I am. Mm -hmm. And I can hold the light for them, so to speak. You find out what could be one level up as far as where you can help bring them up. Because what happens is when you're around two people, yes, either one person's gonna bring somebody else down or the other person's gonna bring somebody else up. Yeah. Or it's usually a combination of the two. But I try to be very careful to hold my position so I don't get brought down. Yeah. I'd rather bring them up. Um, but it is their decision. And sometimes they're not in the space where you can bring them up. And then you need to be, I'm really big on freedom. I want to be free for other people to do what they do, free for them not to do what they do, free for them to say what they're going to say, free for them not to say, free for myself to be, do, and have what I want, be, do, and have what I don't, be, do, and have what I don't want. 
So a lot of it has to do with how free are you for this person to be in the, in the spot that they're in. And if you can listen, like with my wife, I've learned to listen. And the more I listen, the more I can help her if she's having a conflict or a problem. Yep. But I really need to listen first. And then I can sneak in a little bit of resolution or suggestion and mm -hmm. help bring her attitude up. And it will work. And sometimes I can't. Sometimes she just wants to be listened to. And sometimes those people do too as well. If they're a part of your team and it's distracting from the whole team, then you might want to remind the rest of the team, hey, hold your position. Yep. This person is going through what they're going through. Just because they're going through it, just because they're saying what they're saying doesn't mean that I need to be affected by it. You yeah. do not need to be the effect of what other people are spewing. Yeah. Unless it's good stuff that you want to affect you, it is going <laughs> to empower also. you. But it's yeah. very critical that people understand that because people f really believe that if someone's yelling at them, that they should be yelled at. Yep. You understand? Just because someone's yelling at you, you could just put up a shield yep. and just hold your position. Yeah. So I get it. I understand. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. And that's one of the greatest powers one can have because then it's not going to suck the energy out of you. Yeah. I love that. That's so great. Thank you for sharing that. And that actually sparks so many more questions for me, but I'm going to ask one that's a little bit deep here right now and we'll see where this goes. But I, I want to know, because for me, I'm, I'm a real believer in we all give off energy. We yeah. can walk into a room and we can make people feel joy. We can make people feel loads of different emotions without ever having to open our mouth. The thing I want to know, and this is something that, you know, for me has been a big experience, particularly over the last 18 months, given, you know, the world that we're in now, is that there can be times where you notice that you are feeling, you feel like you're in a funk, you feel flat, you feel not quite right. And it takes a little bit sometimes to realize that that's not coming from you. You sort of, you know, when you kind of go, I feel yeah. really sad or down or depressed, but I'm not sad or down or depressed, but I'm feeling it. Then you realize it's because there's somebody else around you right now who's going through something. And that's the point where you go, okay, it's them. Now, some of us stay unaware of this for a long, long time. This has only been a recent learning for me in the last few years that, you know, we can take on the energy of people around us without realizing it. We can take on sadness or frustration or even anger, but we can also take on the, the great emotions as well. Do you have, I am going somewhere with this, do you have some tips on how people can identify when it's their emotion and maybe when it's coming from someone else around them? That's a fantastic question because sometimes we can't identify it. But I think the way to identify it is how did you feel before you were exposed to that person? Mm -hmm. If you were feeling rather balanced, then you started getting exposed to their situation. And you started feeling unbalanced. You might need to hold the light for them, so to speak. Yep. And yep. those that attitude shift I showed you can work incredibly well. And I do it and people don't even know. I'll just be standing there and just go, <laughs> and I just start getting this well because yeah. I'm, I'm what I'm doing is I'm re it really is important to recall a time yeah. when you were feeling joyful, when you were feeling successful, mm -hmm. when you were feeling happy, when you were feeling love, when you were feeling gratitude. Gratitude yeah. is an enormously powerful attitude shift for me, yeah. which I will utilize often. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a gratitude evangelist. I mean, Pink called, Pink's nickname for me is Disneyland because of my evangelistic approach, uh, yeah. evangelical approach to gratitude. Yeah. And I think that we all have the power to create and find, you know, if you're in that funk, find anything, the smallest detail, someone, something for which you're grateful or have appreciation and just sit with it for a moment yep. and then find something else and then find something else. And this is what I call a gratitude shift. Because then what you're doing is you're literally building up a fortress or an arsenal of gratitude and it mm -hmm. literally surrounds, fills, and protects you. And you can give that to others. And what is so wonderful about the endorphins in the body and experiences like gratitude is they're contagious. So when you do something good for somebody else, you are actually creating serotonin and dopamine, you know, the endorphins in your own brain, as well as helping to create it for other people. So that's why it's so critical 
that the more good stuff we do for others, the better we feel. Yeah. And the same thing, you can also be really drained by somebody else. But it's very kind of fun and interesting when someone's in a funk, if you just stop them and go, you know what, just for fun, just for kicks, think of a time when you were grateful or think of a time when you were joyful. Just sit with it for one minute. Really, really think of it. You'd be amazed at how you can help shift somebody's attitude by just helping them recall a time. Because our minds are sort of, although the past doesn't exist, our minds sometimes can't really tell the difference between past and present. When you're having a thought, you're in that thought. So your mind will believe that can be like a present thought. So you can really bring that emotion and all those feelings and the experience into present is into a present time, even if it's a previous thought. And sometimes we need to do that. These 18 months have been like nothing we've experienced. It's been really wild and traumatic for all of us. So that's why I've spent a lot of time recalling successful times because we'll be back to successful times. This too shall pass. This is cyclical. So recalling the previous successful times enables you to create that pattern and sort of recreate what you did to be successful. And it pulls you out of that funk and puts you back in that mindset. And that's what the added, why attitude shifting is so incredibly powerful mm. because we need to rely on that in these times where these are not normal times. These are not typical times. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that this is a question that's been on my mind for a little while is, you know, we've got people like Pink, Cher, you, you know, we've got uh, musicians out there that over the last 18 months, you know, we're sitting here going, well, we're taking a hit, you know, we're, we're having to go work from home. But the thing is that these are people that were on the road with crowds of people on a daily basis. Where have you observed and who have you observed make a, a, I guess, a a memorable or an inspiring attitude shift? You know, what have you seen amongst musicians, et cetera, over the last 18 months? Maybe, maybe good and bad. What's going on in the industry right now? And and where can we, can you share a story of, I suppose, attitude shift that's had to happen over the last 18 months with somebody in the industry? Well, a great story is my buddy, Eva, the bass player for Pink. So, Eva hasn't really been making a heck of a lot of money. Eva just bought a house right before COVID. Mm -hmm. She was able to get her mortgage deferred. So she got into taking care of her body, doing a lot of spiritual study. She did a lot of inner work. She did a lot of practicing. She released a lot of music, even though she didn't make money from it. She put together two different EPs. She became very, very putting herself in the cause position rather than the effect position. Mm -hmm. And she said, this has been the greatest 18 months of my life. Financially, it it sucked, but I've managed to, you know, the family has a restaurant. She collected a little unemployment. She worked for a few tips. So she managed to scrape by, got her brand new mortgage. She had never owned a house, got that deferred. And she ended up doing a lot of yoga, getting really healthy, reading all these incredible books, writing all this incredible music. So I think we all have a level of resilience Mm -hmm. and activities that we can engage in by making that decision in the morning. I mean, every morning I wake up and the first thing I say is 24 brand new hours. And then I do a process that Dr. Jim told me called the wins formula. So a lot of people do their own version of this, but this is so effective and it's so quick. Wins stands for what are your wins from yesterday? So I get up in the morning and I think of all my wins, every success I've had, small or big, and I write it down. And that automatically right off the bat puts me in a better mood because I'm focusing on whatever wins I had in the previous day. Then I is what improvements can you make? Because once you've, you know, we're all open to improving once somebody's primed us and we're in a good mood, right? Yeah. So then you think about what kind of improvements can I make? And then N is forecasting. What are your next wins? And so I forecast my wins for the day. And then S is really important. What state do you want to create? And my, my state might be love. It might be confidence. Um, lately, I've really wanted to celebrate the summer. So for the past two weeks, my state has been celebrate the summer because I had a realization that I was working and trying to push and 
build my speaking career in the virtual gigs. I, I, I wasn't taking the time off to yeah. stop and celebrate. I went out and had margaritas with my friend one, one night, and I literally started tearing up. It's very personal because I realized I wasn't celebrating the summer like I wanted to do. I love the summer. I know it's not the summer for you guys, but it will be. Well, at least we got snow today. So. Yeah. <laughs> But, I miss yeah, the summer. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We've t- we, I've spent half of my life the last, you know, few years in, in, in Australia and New Zealand with pink. So uh, I understand yeah. I've been there a lot. You, you get that. Well, uh, maybe I should celebrate the winter because. Well, then, that, then that's know? what you do. <laughs> but I guess for me, because there's a feeling with every season. Yes. And I love the winter too. I love Christmas winter, time yeah. and that whole sort of, you can celebrate that. You can get that kind of feeling that you get. And I realize that. I wasn't allowing myself the summer feeling because I was so focused on work. Yeah. And then I made the decision and that was an attitude shift that's still with me. I'm still celebrating the summer. I've had that as my state for two weeks now. So try the wins formula. It's a really wonderful way to start the day. We're going to pop that in the show notes to remind everyone. I think that's fantastic. I'm going to do it. I think that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that one with us. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Jim. <laughs> so tell us, um, you know, what what is the band up to at the moment, Mark? I mean, what are things like over there for you guys? Are you, is everyone kind of on hold at the moment or, you know, are you still operating but maybe in a different way? What's going on for you guys? We're on hold. Yep. And, yep. Um, I mean, there will be another tour. I don't know when. Hasn't been announced. Can't give any details. I wish I could, but there will be because there always is. <laughs> One of the greatest experiences we had in the last few months is um, Pink got the Icon Award on the Billboard Music Awards. So we got to perform on the Billboard Music Awards. She got to perform. She performed with her daughter. And that same week, that weekend, her documentary got released, All I Know So Far, which for us, it's on Amazon Prime. And it's uh, it chronicles the, the 2019 stadium tour we did. Mm-hmm. And um, from the perspective of her as a woman and her, about her family, like my daughter got as much camera time as I did because we're in it, but it's, it's a different perspective. Yeah. And so, in, but in that week we had a, a private showing of that and we did the billboard music awards. So we all, so the band, the dancers, the singers yep. all got to get together. Some of the crew, a few of the crew people. And it was like, everybody got to be together and it was so glorious. It was so wonderful to see everybody. And yeah, I'll bet hug everybody and hold everybody. It was before things, you know, kind of, yeah. we were in a bit of a, a good place with the COVID. I had a um, storm maybe. Yeah. It was right before the, the, this variant popped out. Yeah. But um, I think it just reminded us all how much we love each other. Yeah. And yeah. Alicia Pink was so humble mm-hmm. because we watched this and I was literally emotional when I was done. It was such an amazing documentary. Yeah. And we all just said, congratulations, that was so, and she goes, no, it's ours, not mine. It's ours. She kept on wanting it. She's, she really loves the family so much yeah. that she doesn't want to take all the credit, even though it really is hers. But the truth is that we have all been, I mean, Eva's the newest member of the band. She joined 14 years ago. <laughs> Adriana left the band for eight years, had a kid and came back. Jason, the musical director, has been in for 21 years. Justin wow. joined right before me. Stacy and, and, and Jenny joined right after me. Oh, no, Jessie's the newest member because she joined in, in 2009. Yeah. But it's just one incredible family. Yeah. And some of the dancers, that. like Rain has been there since I've been there. And the other dancers are newer, they're younger. But we've employed a lot of the same people are employed for multiple tours. And so many of the crew members are still there. So we're all just waiting, but yep. it needs to be safe. Pink got COVID. Her son got COVID ver- very early on. Yep. We never knew. She didn't announce it. We only knew when she announced it publicly. Yep. Yep. Um, so she wants to be safe. Yeah. So when she believes it's safe, I'm sure there'll be. So watch this space, eh? <laughs> yeah. And you know that we're going to be down under a lot. Oh, look, we can't wait for you guys I mean, to come back. I think I'll tell you, I, I spent a year and a half in Australia. Yep. I have some of my best friends live there. I just love the Aussies. I would love New Zealand. My wife, as it turns out, when she was 17, left Sweden and went to school in New Zealand. And so we went back to visit New Zealand when we were playing there, and she saw her old schoolmaster from 20 years ago or yeah, wow. something, or whatever it was, 25 years ago. And wow, just we're, we're so connected yeah. with that part of the world. 
Yeah. Look, I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it feel, it does feel like it's, everything's just a bit on hold right now, but I, I think everyone is just so excited to get back to being able oh, to yeah, have right. things like music events and, you know, seeing yeah. people. And actually one of the things that I've noticed over the last 18 months that I think is probably the unspoken, but probably the, the biggest thing that's missing for me is that human contact. And the fact that we, you said before, hugging everyone was such a big deal. And the thing is that human contact is a natural human need, yet it's something that we've been programmed into not having. We're told to socially distance, to stay apart, to not connect. And yeah. people are sort of going, why do I feel off? Why do I feel not right? And the thing is that that it is something we need. It is natural. And, you know, we're supposed to be close to one another and connect with one another. And, you know, in, in so many ways, I think music events do that. They bring everyone in together and it's kind of like yes. a great big amazing And they will be music. back. Yeah. They will yeah. be back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing I learned, I did, I did some research and I truly believe a lot of it has to do with how we manage change. This is a big change. And there's one of two ways of managing change. You either embrace it or you resist it. And when COVID hit, I was about to have the best speaking year of my life because I was off the road. I had 19 live speaking gigs just in two months in March and April, oh. gone. Yeah. And I'd never done a virtual speech. And I do, a, it's like a rock show disguised as a keynote. It's drumming, it's high energy, it's all this crazy stuff. I bring people on stage. I thought I could never recreate it. I was so resisting. I was afraid. I was anxious. And then I woke up a couple mornings later and I thought, what kind of pathetic story am I telling myself? Mm -hmm. I've been resisting. And I, and I thought, I'm going to reframe this experience. Yep. I'm going to embrace it. And it's almost like magic. Like when I made a decision, because when you make a decision, you're cutting off all other possibilities. When I decided to embrace it, all of a sudden, I started getting these creative ideas. Yep. And I started getting these solutions. And rather than being barrier fixated, I became goal oriented. Then I was getting excited about doing the virtual presentation. Then I couldn't wait to put it together. Now I've had dozens of virtual presentations with some really happy clients, yeah. but it took the attitude shift. It took the understanding that what I realized is what we resist not only persists, mm. it gets bigger. Yeah. So the more you resist something, the bigger it gets. Yeah. So if you can just remember that if you're resisting anything personally, professionally, and you just embrace it, embrace it. I know it sounds strange, but embrace it. You'd be amazed at how creative and how solutions are in your mind becomes because your mind, you're senior to your mind. I don't know, call it spirit, call it God, call it whatever you want, but there's something running the show. I don't believe we are our minds. If you, the moment you believe you are your mind, then you're just your thoughts. I believe once we make a decision, something deeper, without getting into, I'm not a religious guy, but I do believe that we make the decision and then our minds follow. So when I somehow made a decision to embrace it, then my mind started going, oh, we're going to embrace it now. Okay, that means we could do this and this and this and this and this and this. And it's like, wow, you'd be amazed at how creative, how solutions oriented you become. And that's what I found. Because I was scared, man. I was scared. Like we were all yeah. scared. But, you know, there are always ways of taking things and shifting them and getting creative and, Absolutely. and, 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 and creating more solutions and finding other ways. And, I mean, even in the, in the direct selling, I mean, I know you're all selling different products, but I'm speaking for a direct seller live. I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for Pure Romance, which uh, is a, they, you know, they sell. Sensual uh, products. I've sensual products, we'll call them. Yes. I'm just staring at one of the, yeah, yeah. got these guys. <laughs> they, they sell sensual products, but now they're selling whole body products as well. They're rebranding. Yeah. But man, when COVID hit, they were laughing. They were yep. rocking. They said at May of last year, starting May of last year, they were just, you know, doing the direct selling and they were doing social selling and yeah. and people were breaking records because they had a captive audience because people yeah. were home. Absolutely. So they wanted to use the products. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, a lot of businesses, it depends on, of course, what you sell, but a lot of people can will really, really embrace it. And yeah. if they yeah. believe that you're there to help them, especially in a crisis, in a pandemic. So instead of trying to shove a product down their throat, you're like, I want to help. And this is tough on all of this. How can I help you? And they know that you really mean it. 
you know? So good. Yeah, I love that. And uh, now I've got one more serious question. And then I've actually got some questions that my kids have Serious asked. question? Oh, okay, no, no, we can serious. be serious. I know, I know. All right, well, we, we can have fun with this one because I actually, <laughs> to me, this one is a bit of a, I okay, think. I'm going to switch, a I'm gonna switch to a pink background then. Here, okay, we'll have a little bit right, more We'll fun. switch the background. We'll switch it up. All right, so last Serious question. We don't have to answer it serious. What advice, what one piece of advice would you give to someone who is feeling a bit stuck or overwhelmed right now in their business? Shift your attitude. Yay. Recall a time when you were successful. I mean, yep. smell it, taste it, feel it, feel every emotion and every feeling you felt. You need to realign yourself with that success, with what it feels like to be successful. Remind yourself. Remember, your mind will be all of a sudden you're there again. It's real. It becomes so real. You can feel every emotion. You yes. can feel every sense. Feel the sense of success. Yes. I it can agree. pull you out of being stuck. It can also inspire you to create and think of something you might not have thought of. And I think yes. that's what's so critical. It's like we're all rock stars, man. We all have yes. so much creativity. Allow your creativity to flow. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Questions from my kids. Are you ready? Yes. Now, I, di- I allowed them to ask whatever they wanted, so we're going to go with the flow here. <laughs> You're going to bear with me. The first one comes from my son, Aiden. Now, Aiden's 12. And, my daughter's um, 11. I love it. Yep. So here's what he asked, and he legitimately has wanted to do this for a while, so I knew this was where he was going to go. He said, I want to play drums. What should I do to get started, Mark? Well, I always say a couple of things. One is listen to every kind of music you possibly can. Find what you like about the music. When you find what you like, you learn. When you discredit it and say, I don't like it, you'll never learn. The the next thing is get a teacher and listen to everything they say. And you start with some sticks and a practice pad. Learn how to get some of the basic foundation, the fundamentals, the greatest sports coaches. John Madden, one of the greatest American sports coaches, they said, what are the three top things you focus on? He said, fundamentals, fundamentals, and fundamentals. <laughs> Love it. It's like awesome. when you're buying real estate, area, area, and area. So, <laughs> and so you want to just start by learning to study with a teacher, whether it's online or in person, learn how to hold the sticks, learn how to do the rudiments, and then have your teacher start to work with you on songs. Always have fun. Always end every practice session with something fun. So the last thing you remember about the instrument is joy. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like work. Remember, we don't work music. We play music. Yeah. True. So true. I love that. Awesome. Uh, now, Levi, who is eight, he's about to turn nine. Hi, Levi. To- he was keen to know, other than playing in a band, what other things do you like to do? Oh, wow. I love to go to the beach. I love to hang out with my family. I love to go on vacation with my family. I love, we love to, taking drives. I love my dog. We got a puppy. We got a woodle, a half wheaten terrier and poodle. My a girls woodle. are in Sweden right now. Yeah, it's a woodle. Because if it wasn't called a woodle, it'd have to be called a Putin. And that ain't going to work. So, <laughs> so my, I've been bringing the dog everywhere with me because my wife and my daughter are in Sweden. They're in the north of Sweden. They're gone because I'm working. So, like, I need a best friend. So, I've been taking the dog. I love playing with the dog. I love going to the gym. I'm back in the gym and I'm working out. I'm wearing a mask. I love doing that. Love writing music. I love hanging out with my friends. I love watching muse, uh, movies. I love drinking tequila. I love Mexican food. I love to hang out with my friends. I love fantastic, inspiring conversations. I love to go climbing. I uh, love to go to the beach. I love to go in the water. Um, I'm not a good surfer, but I do love to body surf. And I love to just be in any tropical environment I can. Um, I love driving my Mercedes. Oh, Yeah. Do you know what I love? I love that you know what you love. I think that is. Well, you got me started. All of a sudden, I was like, just started. I've never listed so many things I've loved, you know? Thank you. That's Uh, awesome. I'm going to go write down a list of things I love after this because you've been yeah. excited. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Gets you excited, right? Yes. Thinking about all the things you love. Yes. I love that. I love that you love that. Right. The next one comes from Riley. Now, Riley's 15. Oh, I love playing with pink. I love being on stage with pink. I mean, look at that background. I've got a pink background Actually, right now. It's really How could you distracting. not love playing with those people? You know? <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm sort of half listening to you, half enjoying the movie in the background there. Right. <laughs> Do I have uh, to change it? Are you getting distracted? No, no, I'm good. Keep it, keep it going. Good. It's great. It's just it's making me think of, yeah, <laughs> things I love. Okay, so Riley is 15. And okay. Hey, Riley. Riley. Riley's asked, 
Can you share a funny story from the road? Can I share a funny story from a the road? Oh my God, this is a typical 15-year-old boy here. Funny story. Not inspiring you. What's funny? <laughs> Thanks, funny bro. story from the road. We're like, always laughing and always having fun. And, of course, now the time is like, what was, f- like, what's specifically funny? This, what? <laughs> 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 Not even stuff I can repeat, but this is we, have our, we, have, we have our own, we have our own microphones on stage. So what people don't know is like when they're playing our movies and stuff on the stage, we get on our microphones, we start telling jokes and start talking crap and just <laughs> we have so much fun and, and sometimes it gets a little dirty. And it's it's really funny. I mean, never while we're playing, obviously, when you're playing. But I'm talking about like because there's so many you know films and different things, or there or there might be a dance routine, and if someone's doing a really serious dance routine, and then somebody picks up a mic and says, you know, or something, and it's something funny, whatever. So we're always finding ways to have fun, and we're and on the you know one of the most fun things we do is after we're done, we get on the bus because we usually we're always doing bus tours, not in Australia because we can't bus in Australia, but all the other times and we're always just, we're playing games, we're watching movies and we're we're just constantly cracking up and constantly having as much fun as we possibly can whenever we can and doing fun things and pink is one of the funniest people on the planet. So we go out to dinner, we start drinking wine and eating really good food and we are just cracking up. So we're it's kind of like we're always having fun and oh God, we've done some really specifically fun things like like we were in South Africa and we went we went um what's the word when you're on a string and you're um oh man. Zip lining? Zip lining. We went yeah. zip lining down a mountain like birds, down a mountain going what seventy miles an hour. What is that? About 110 kilometers an hour. I like, love that you do like, that conversion. Ver- vertically. Else does. <laughs> so that was crazy fun. And it wasn't even scary because you're not feeling the ground rush. So that was crazy fun. So we're always having fun. Sorry, I, I mean, I'm, you know, you want to hear something specific, but not that's just great. Generally, speaking, Actually, we're always having fun. It does, you know, we like we've talked a lot about pink, and I love, love, love pink. But someone else that I really love that I would love to hear a story from, whether it's inspiring or otherwise, is Cher. 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 How do you say it in America? Say it for me. Cher. Cher. Okay. <laughs> like Cher and Cher alike. I would love to hear a story from the road with Cher. Do you have something that you can share? Share, share about Cher. Well, I've got a pretty frightening and wild story, Cher story. This will be Let's my go last with that story. one. Third show of the tour, farewell tour, Cleveland, Ohio, right? The band, oh, we always open up with still haven't found what I'm looking for. Cher comes out, gets on a platform that's shaped like a chandelier. It's modeled after a chandelier after her very own home. Mm-hmm. They bring her 40 feet up, right? We can't even see her. All you see is the platform. We start playing, and normally she starts singing, you know, I have found, that, you know, the, whatever the songs are. And we're, we're playing, and she's not singing. I'm thinking, well, what's going on? Maybe her mic's broken. Maybe her mic's broken. Then I look up, and the air conditioner was really strong. It had blown this... <laughs> what do you call it? The chandelier that she was on, it had blown her off of the chandelier. She was wearing a little like metal protector that was supposed to keep her on and it got caught on the scaffolding. So then the platform flew forward. She was dangling from this metal belt. All you could see was like dangling share feet. And Everybody stopped. The, all of a sudden, the band stopped. The audience stopped. Everybody was completely silent. And I think they realized the only way that they could not get her down, they'd have to bring, they, they'd start, because the platform had come down without her. So they brought oh, the platform God. back off. They turned off the air conditioner. They realized she would have to unhook herself. And all of a sudden, and we're like deadly silent, all like scared to death. All of a sudden, we hear the thump. It's like, Thank God, that must be Cher. Hopefully she's okay. And then the platform comes down. And by this point, the assistant's on stage, the assistant's assistant, the assistant's assistant, the management, 40 people are on stage. They come down. People are crying. They're just like, they come down and I see Cher walk off the stage. She, Her eyes are bright and wide. She was scared to death. And then we're all left out there. The audience is silent. The bands, we're all looking at each other. I'm looking at the musical director, Paul. We're like, what's going to happen? And I thought to myself, show's over, tour's over. Homegirl doesn't need the money. It's a farewell tour. She's wealthy. I thought, third show, we're going to cancel it. It's done. And then we're just not knowing what to do. Finally, I said, okay, 
That's it. I pick up my stick bag. I'm about to jump off the stage. Cher comes running out from behind the stage with a mic in her hand like she'd been zapped by electricity. She said, let's do this. And oh we were God. amazed. And we played the show and she was on fire the entire show. Then that became the subject of her monologue. She used to say, I almost dropped to my death, but they wouldn't even care I dropped to my death. They were, they'd were they only be talking about the $40,000 dress that had blood all over it that I ruined that was made by Bob Mackey. So she took that situation and took something that most people would have just said, I'm never going to do this again, like literally scared to death. And it just energized her. And yeah. That show, that tour ended up lasting three years. She ended up being the highest grossing wow. female artist of all time and the, and the, and the longest tour of all time. Whatever, awesome. What would have happened if she'd not come back out? Yeah. Oh, what a powerful story. I knew you'd have something good for me. I love well, that. It's, it it's, it's represents how powerful she yeah. is. Yeah. Because you know what? The world class, it's like when Pink got back on the stage. Yeah. Is that's what the world class do. Yeah. You want to be world class? Look, the world class begins where our comfort zones end. You want to stay inside your comfort zone? Good for you. Love Not it. if you want to be world class. Yep. Last three quick questions. Number one, your favorite book. We've got a book list. We're adding to it. We'd love to know your favorite book. Now, there's no, it could be anything. Um, could be not. Well, of course, yours. We're going to put your books on the book list. Blink by Malcolm, my Malcolm Gladwell is a big favorite. The most graph important in the graph in the world. It yep. just describes so simply about some of the most critical things you can do yep. to remember how you learn and your memory are so tied together. I love Wayne Dyer, big fan of Wayne Dyer. Yep. Big fan of Seth Godin. Seth I've Godin read a few of, a few of Seth's books. So kind of anything by Seth yep. is great. Love is a killer app by my friend, Tim Sanders. Yep. Just yep. is one of the great, he was the chief solutions officer for Yahoo. And he's such a brilliant writer and speaker. Um, so there's a few. That's you fantastic. Know? Thank you. I also and, um, used, I read every Michael Crichton book. I'm a huge Michael Crichton fan. So any Crichton as well. Awesome. We are, we're yeah. building a, a book list for our Accelerator members. And, uh, and man, we've got some amazing books on that list. So we're going to throw those ones on there. We'll throw yours on there too. Very last Thank question. You. If you could have any superpower, Mark. What would you choose? Oh my God, my daughter and I debate. We watch The Flash, so we debate this all the time. <laughs> and I really think for it's between super strength like Superman or just having the greatest, just a super, the most powerful mind. I think having the most powerful mind would be the, the greatest superpower ever. I love that. And what would it, what does your daughter say? Super strength. Um, my daughter, I think, wants to be like, so, like uh, Supergirl, she wants to just have like the greatest strength, you know. Do you think that's about flying though? Because I feel like for every kid, it's about flying. And just the and just the ultra strength, so you could do anything. You were just so strong that nothing could stop you. <laughs> I love. Um, that. But I think if you have the strongest mind, then nothing can stop you. No, I, I completely agree with you. Well, it's been absolutely amazing chatting with you today, Mark. Thank you so uh, much. My for pleasure. Listen, you know what I'm going to do right now for everybody. I invite you, I am your own personal rock star for life. So I'm going to give you my own personal email. I respond to all emails. It might take me a while, but anything you want to ask me, I'll here you it. go. There you go. It if is. you guys have got burning questions, he's going to check it up on the screen, but there we'll also put it in the show. Mark at markshulman.com. Beautiful. Look at that right there for you. And I will answer you. So please email me. And I'm there for you. Oh, wait, that one doesn't have a background. This one should have a background. There we go. Here's a background. <laughs> so, Mark, um, uh, they can reach out to you on email. Uh, of course, we'll put your social media channels up as well so they can follow you where yeah. you want them to follow you. Well, um, at Marky Planet is my Instagram and my Twitter. I really love LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is the greatest business platform. Um, I post on Instagram and then my social media guy puts everything out everywhere else. But yeah. I will sometimes write articles or write write blurbs. I do a lot of videos and the videos always end up on Instagram. And you can join my newsletter by going to my website, mark and markshulman.com. And I'm constantly putting stuff out. Not constantly, actually less, usually once a month. I was doing it every week and I thought, you know, once a month is enough for a newsletter. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I don't read half of my best friend's newsletters, you know? <laughs> so. 
Awesome. So guys, there is so much stuff there. We're going to throw all of that into the show notes for everybody so that they can grab those resources as well. But Mark, thank you so much for taking oh, your time out of your busy schedule. It's been so inspiring chatting with you today. And I really appreciate your generosity with your time. Sam, you rock, baby. And you know what? You're, the lighting stayed perfect on you the whole time. For, yeah, for <laughs> I was warning Mark about the changing sun in Australia and how our lighting <laughs> just changes throughout the day. Thank you so much. It's been great. My pleasure. It's been, it's been um, re- re- I, I'm so grateful and honored that you gave me the time. Thank beautiful. You. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to see what comes next for you guys. We're going to be watching and listening and waiting with bated breath for you guys. To come and guys, back to watch Australia. that documentary. Watch the documentary. Yes. Not, yeah. not because you're going to see a bunch of me. You'll see me, but she's so phenomenal. Yeah. All I know so far. It's what it's called. All I know so far. Yeah. Awesome. So, it's All so I pink. Know. It's such a pink <laughs> thing to say. Because she's is. so humble. It is. I love it. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to watching it. We'll put that in the show notes too for everyone. Thanks again, Mark. And thanks everyone for tuning in and listening to us again this week. We look forward to seeing you all again next week. God bless and bye for now. Bye, everybody. <laughs>